Perfect. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, this is our lecture thirty-first. Wow, we did a lot right? in high-dimensional probability and applications in data science. So here is here was the idea of, of last class. We we look at the networks, which are very complex graphs arising from maybe social networks, biological networks, and then we ask ourselves, okay, how do we make how do we make um, sense of its structure? How do we see the structure of these graphs? How do we even visualize the graph? How do we find communities which are tightly um, tightly connected clusters of nodes in this graph? All we know is which nodes are which vertices are connected to which vertices. That's all we see by just looking at the presentation of the graph in the computer. We don't see the communities. We don't see any structure. How do we make? How do we find the structure in the graphs? Here is the idea. Okay. We do not know how to do it in general. Let's start with a very simple model. Let's find, let's um, build a, a like a simplest non-trivial model, mathematical model of a network with communities, solve it for this simplest baby model. And maybe that will inspire us how to, what to do in general. So, so last class we proposed the following probabilistic model for the simplest probabilistic model for a network with two communities. And it's called stochastic block model. Very popular, uh, very popular object in maybe last 10 years or so due to its simplicity. Basically, we generate the two communities, but we will not tell the computer which com which is which. So the vertices here, let's uh, let's go. So we put we separate the vertices in two halves, n over two vertices on the left, n over two on the right. Let's just for simplicity call these vertices boys and these vertices girls. So we have a class with boys and girls. And they make friends with each other, boys with boys, girls with, with girls, maybe boys with girls. And then we, um, the vertices are deterministic. They're just n over two vertices that are boys, n over two vertices that are girls, nothing random about them. The edges will be probabilistic. So we'll draw an edge between any pair of boys with probability p any pair of girls with probability p and any pair of mixed gender boy and girl with probability q let's say less than p maybe this is an elementary uh, school and, and boys are boys want to make friends with boys and girls with girls and and um boys and girls make friends less likely than than the the, the kids of the same gender that is that will be our model so edges edges occur at random between every two uh, vertices every two kids edges occur at random independently with probabilities p or q depending on whether it's mixed gender or the same gender And then the community detection problem is give the computer the graph generated from GNP. So given a, a, a GNPQ, given a, a stochastic block, given a graph generated from the stochastic block model, just one graph random graph, find the two communities. Let the computer find the two communities. Of course, we will not tell the computer who are boys and who are girls, and the computer is supposed to do that. And the ideal output of this algorithm will be something like this. Let me show you. Where is it? Oh, here we go. The ideal output would be something like this. Also, boys and well, maybe 
the computer will not be able to tell which are boys and which are girls, right? It's all symmetric, but at least it will separate in these two communities up to late building. Yeah, good. Okay, is the problem crystal clear? Everything is okay? How we set it up, how the models, what's the model, what we want to do with it, and so on. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Let's go and solve it. Um, the beauty of this is that, yes, this baby model is solvable, and there is a theorem, very beautiful theorem about it, and the, the method of solution inspired, is really inspiring, and it's generalizable and scalable. That we can apply this method to more complex models, in particular realistic models of, of graphs. Good. The key to success is random matrix theory, and that's why we're discussing it now. How are random matrices connected to random graphs? Well, very simply, the, when we tell, when we present the graph to the computer, we actually present a matrix, the matrix of connections, you know, which which vertices are connected and which are not. That's gen, that's presented as a matrix. That's matrix is called the adjacency matrix, and because the edges occur at random, it will be a random matrix, right? So it's 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 there already. So let's formally define the, the adjacency matrix definition the adjacency matrix. It's the matrix that encodes the graph. Let's say we have the graph with V, the set of vertices. E is the set of edges, telling us which, which pairs are connected. And for simplicity, we will label the vertices as one, two, three, and so on. Let's say N of them. Um, the adjacency matrix of the graph, it's a matrix with whose entries are zero or one, depending on whether the vertices are connected, whether this pair of vertices is connected or not. It's one if this pair of vertices ij belongs to E. And remember, E is a set of edges. So if, this, if they are connected, basically, it's just a fancy way of writing that there is an edge between I and J. So if they're connected and zero, if they're not connected, there is no edge, I and J. For example, if, if we have a graph like this, just two, three vertices, uh, one, two, three, and two edges. Then the matrix A will be three by three, obviously. The rows and columns are indexed by vertices. And zero is not connected to two, zero. There are no loops. One is not connected to one, two is not connected to two. So no loops, I put zeros on the diagonal. Oh, wait, this is, sorry. What's, what's about zero? Sorry, it's, they're labeled one, two, three. One, yeah, my bad. One, two, three, here two, one, two, three. Yeah, so one is not connected to one, two is not connected to two. Otherwise we would have little loops and, and we don't want loops. Okay, one is connected to two, two is connected to one, one is con not connected to three, three is not connected to one, two is connected to three, three is connected to two. Here we go. Good. N by N, generally, N by N symmetric, random. In our case, it will be a random matrix because we draw the edges at random. In fact, the entries, in our case, the entries will be, um, what's the distribution of entries, by the way? So it's either zero or one. And what is this random variable called that's either zero or one? Bernoulli. Bernoulli, thank you again. Yeah, this is Bernoulli. So with independent Bernoulli entries. entries. Either there are Bernoulli with, with probability P of being one or 
Bernoulli with probability Q of being one, depending on whether it's mixed gender or, or same gender. Cool. Good. That's what the adjacency matrix is, and and now I just generated the adjacency matrix for the stuck for the stochastic block model for this girls boys model. It's right there, and it looks like this. So here are boys, girls. Of course, I knew when I when I gen generated this, we knew that who who are boys and girls. So I put all boys together, I put all girls together, and the matrix looks like a nice kind of. The dots, the dots are ones there, and empty spaces are zero. So the matrix looks like a already block matrix, but the com but we we would not tell the computer who the boys and the girls are. So if you look at this matrix, you will not see this block structure. In fact, it's our job to find this structure. Now we have. Okay, good. Any questions? So far, so good. Everything is clear, stochastic block model, right? Random up. This is the adjacent symmetrics of it, ones or zeros. It has independent entries, or kind of independent entries, independent entries above the diagonal. And then we reflect them because it is symmetric. Um, the distribution of entries is either Bernoulli with probability P, right there, P, P, or Bernoulli with probability Q. mixed gender. And because Q is less than P, we'll have less connections here and the matrix is denser in the in the boy, boy, girl, girl than it is boy, girl. Cool. Okay, so that is, that's a model that we're working on. We can forget now about the graph. The matrix encodes the graph completely. And when we see it, when we look at this matrix, we see, oh goodness, this is this looks like a block matrix almost, except it's random, but it it feels like a block matrix. To make it a block matrix, really like a really block matrix, we could take expectation. So when we take the expectation of Bernoulli with probability p, the expected value of that, of course, is p. Yeah, it's one with probability p zero. When we take expectation here, it will be Q. In fact, every entry will be P. Every entry will be Q. And here, every entry will be Q. And here, every entry will be P. It will be a very nice block magic. So expected value of the adjacency magic is super cool. It's actually a rank two matrix, probably, because all of the entries are the same in each block. OK, so that will, our, will be our key. This magic is very simple. So let's let's. Hold on to it. Um, how? Let's just let's just think. So expected value of A is is um, a block matrix like this. Well, the zeros are on the diagonal. Let me explain this on on a four by four matrix. So zero on the diagonal, but otherwise all entries here will be P, P and all entries here will be Q. Okay, it's a little annoying that the zeros on the, are on the diagonal because if we have P's on the diagonal, that will be much better. It will be just, let's, let's in, heuristically, it's just an, another level of the idea. Heuristically, let's forget about the zeros. Let's fill them in. P, 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 Q, 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 Q. Hopefully there is a little, uh, it's just a little change maybe. Okay, so this magic is much better. Let's call it B. The basic idea of, the, uh, of our analysis is this. Because of matrix concentration, such as matrix Hovding, Bernstein, Chernoff inequality, the random matrix A concentrates near its expectation. So this will be matrix concentration. Therefore, our matrix A will be close to this matrix, which is close to this matrix, which is a very nice and simple one. <laughs> B, so our, our graph, our A, adjacency matrix A is will be kind of close to this matrix in the operator norm, probably. 
And that matrix is very simple to analyze. So let's do it. Let's look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of B. B has rank two. That's because they're just P, Q, Q, P, and then they're replicated all over. Rank two. So the, the top eigenvalue has two eigenvalues. The top eigenvalue, I, I compute it. It's very easy to compute the eigenvalue of this matrix is P plus Q over two times N. Do it yourself. It's, it's like one line exercise. And the corresponding eigenvector of B is, uh, is, uh, is this is one, one, and I will put a, a bar like this to indicate the block, minus one, um, one, one, all ones. Okay, uh, the second eigenvalue is P minus Q divided by two over N, and the second eigenvector is one one i put a line to indicate the block like this is boys and now now we come to the girls minus one minus one probably should normalize them that the euclidean norm is root n here so i divide by root n and this is this is by this is four by four but really it's all ones in the boys and all negative ones in the girls. So it's n over two times n. Okay, easy exercise. What do we see from this? What, what is it telling us really? Okay, look at B. How can we know who, who the girls are and who the boys are? We won't know it from here. It's all ones, one, 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 one. But we will know it from here. The second eigenvector of B exactly tells us who the boys and who are the girls are. It separates them. It's one, one for the boys and minus one, minus one for the girls. We just look at the sign. Right? So this, this thing miraculously, miraculously encodes the communities. The second eigen, the coefficients of the Second eigenvector of A of B um, determine the communities. The community membership. Agreed. Okay. So how do you make that uh, useful? We do not know B. We just took expectation, but we hope that our adjacency matrix, which we know is close to B. And if adjacency matrix is close to B, let's say in the operator norm, then we can use perturbation theory. So the, the idea of our, of our argument would be to use perturbation theory, they, um, namely davis kahan inequality, which says something like this. Is two, if two matrices are close, then their eigenvalues and eigenvectors are closed. So by davis kahan inequality, this the first eigenvector, the second eigenvector, sorry, of A, which we know will be close to the second eigenvector of B, which is this, and which determines the communities. So if we take the signs of the coefficients of the second eigenvector, they will they will probably de also determine the communities. The coefficients of a of v of this will probably not be exactly one one minus one one minus one, but if they are close, then maybe just the signs of them will be enough to. And that's it. So that's a that's an idea of, of solution in the simple case, and we will now make it happen. This is just an idea. We didn't prove anything yet. So just it's very important. So I'll, I want to say it one more time. What's the idea? 
our adjacency matrix is a random matrix. We approximated by deterministic matrix, which is expected value. I forget about zero. So we approximated by something like this. This matrix is very simple, rank two. Its second eigenvector encodes the communities, determines the communities. And therefore, the second eigenvector of our matrix, which is approximately the same, will also determine the communities by taking the signs. So the algorithm will be just take the adjacency matrix, compute the second eigenvector, look at the signs, and here it is, clustered. Good. Any questions? Yeah. Actually, actually uh, so in this case, B is uh, expectation plus identity multiplied by P, which exactly. makes not, it possible not to... Yeah, not identity, but diagonal matrix, like P, P, Q, Q. Yeah, Pablo. Uh, no, I mean the diagonal is, I, uh, we have P's on the diagonal, so that's, uh, we have to add uh, identity multiplied by P, as I understand, or am I missing something? We have to add I, P, P, Q, Q. Oh, no, 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 you're, oh. yeah, you're right, you're sorry, identity. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, identity, you're right. Identity multiplied yeah. by P, sorry. Yeah, so so what I'm what I try to say then we can exactly quantify how is it different. So that that uh, rough estimation of expectation and B between them we can exactly quantify it, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's our, okay. that's the least of our problems. This is this is good. Yeah, this is just identity multiplied by P and P is less than one, let's say, and so at at most the the difference will be one in the operator norm. So this step is is almost trivial. It's not. This is not the problem. The, the problem will be not the problem, but but this this is the least trivial step. Yeah, Pablo, did I answer your question? Good. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah. Of course. Perfect. Okay. Okay. If everything is clear, we'll state the theorem now, and then we'll prove it. Okay. So here is a theorem. Theorem about community detection. Detection. This algorithm not only works nicely, but it also works for very, very sparse graphs, which is what we want. Realistic graphs are very, realistic networks are very sparse. So in fact, it will work for P and Q on the level of one over N. So if P, let's scale it a little bit. So P is A over N and let's call B, Q B over N, which means that on average, every, let's say every boy has uh, how many friends? A, so it's P times N over two. There's N over two other boys or something like that. P N over two. So A over N times N over two, that's about A over two friends. A over two friends. Who are boys and B over two friends who are girls. All right, so if P is, we scale it P as A over N, Q B over N, we assume uh, that B is less than A, so less, so the, the mixed gender friendships are less likely, and let's say less than 3A. This is just for simplicity. But the most important assumption is how, how P is different from Q. Uh, of course, it can't work all the time. Like if P equals Q, there is no community. There's no, no community structure. If, if, if girls and boys have friends with equal probabilities, then of course, there is no any, any community, right? So P has to be separated from Q. And the question is how? So P is scaled as A, Q is scaled as B. So here's a separation assumption, A minus B squared, this kind of the gap between the probabilities must be greater than C A log N. This is what I get from, from this, where C is an absolute constant large enough. Then with high probability, let's say probability less than 0.99, can be arbitrary number here. The signs of the coefficients of V2 of A, which is the second, the 
second top eigenvector of the adjacency matrix recover the two communities with high accuracy, let's say 99% accuracy. Again, can be arbitrary number here. And 99% accuracy means that there may be misclassified misclassified points. So I may uh, the computer may think that one girl is a boy or a boy is a girl. So some errors are possible, but there are no more than one percent of these errors. There are no more than zero point zero one n misclassified vertices. Cool, this is our theorem, we're gonna prove it. Any question about anything so far, including the theorem, the statement of the theorem? Yeah. Good. Separation assumption, so far so good. Yeah, A minus B squared, so some, it, it must be needed, but exactly what form it is, exactly why this assumption about A minus B square is natural. I don't know it's natural, it's just what I have to, from the proof. Um, great question though. We need some assumption on A minus B, right? If A equals B, no theorem is possible. That should be clear, right? Because then uh, girls and boys, boys and girls have the same probabilities of connection and no, no communities form. So there must be some assumption on A minus B. Whether this assumption is natural or the other one, I do not know. In fact, this type of assumption is the best possible. That was proved recently. Uh, and I will I'll comment on that next time. But we'll see how and, it follows from. Sorry. And will it actually work in the other direction? So if uh, not, uh, if P and Q are like, the, the Q is much larger than P, will it also work? If uh, yeah, I uh, yeah, 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 it should work. It actually will follow from the proof. Let's look at the proof and you will see that it, it should follow. Although yeah, in this case, I, yeah, I, I yeah. just mean that then the symmetricity of this uh, kind of condition is a very kind of yeah, fitting. Right. So, yeah, we right. just need A and B to be far, far away, and, the, and then we, we will have yeah, better results. The, mm -hmm, yeah, the tr okay, the, the true can the best possible condition is this, I think it says 2a plus b. Uh, that's what, that'll take a lot of work, but this is the best possible, I think, condition, in which case there is symmetry between a and b. Uh, so I should probably add an a plus b here, but in this case, it doesn't matter. Um, that's, this optimal condition is not possible to achieve with the spectral with this spectral algorithm it's a different algorithm so and it is known that if the condition is not satisfied let's say if it's less than then uh, no algorithm can succeed it's like the communities just don't form you can you can't tell anything so that's actually there's yeah for um if we put two here maybe two plus epsilon. That will mean that there is an algorithm that does a little bit better than a random guess. So it will classify like 51% correctly and 45 incorrectly, something like that. A random guess will do 50-50. Um, if you put some absolute constant here in front of it, then you can achieve 99% accuracy de depending on the constant, of course. Uh, and and we our result is just off by a log factor from the completely optimal result which is okay in practice maybe yeah. so that's that's the state of the art yeah good Pablo yeah answer your question yeah yeah yeah, yeah. thanks mm -hmm. good mm -hmm. can I 
Uh, yeah, Denise, one more, one moment. I just want to say about this, and I will ask, and I'll, I'll tell you. So, uh, just while we are discussing this, the result, the results that this is the best possible, and the result that this is achievable by some algorithm, is due to Elkanan Mosel and his collaborators. And Elkanan is, is a fantastic researcher from now from MIT. Uh, one of the leaders in this area in probability generally and its applications to computer science, he will talk to us. Okay, so he's he's our guest, um, guest, not this Tuesday, not tomorrow, but the week after. So we're on the same team developing mathematics for deep learning, and, and he's he he uh, agreed to talk to us. He's he's one of the fantastic people, and so please don't. Uh, don't miss this opportunity. Yeah. Yes, Denise. Uh, yeah, I'm a bit confused about your notation of inequality. Then uh, this is b less than a and less than three times a. What is the meaning of less than three times a? Yeah. 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 Great. Thanks for the question. This is um, this is about this thing. Less than three a. We could have, I could, have, I could get rid of that. This theorem actually holds for b just less than a. But for this particular proof, or the simple proof, to be able to get it over in like twenty-five remaining minutes, uh, will I throw another assumption that a is less than three a b a is oh three b yeah, exactly? I'm confused now too. Yeah, why did I put this three <laughs> b? So they're comparable to each other. They can be very close, but not, not too far. Any question? Any other questions? Okay, perfect. So this is our theorem. It's our theorem that we're going to prove one more time. Let's look at it before we prove it. So we want to. Uh, the idea is to approximate a by its expectation, that's matrix concentration, then fill in the diagonal, that's a little step. So that will be our B, and then use perturbation theory. Okay, let's do it, proof. Unless there are any questions anymore. Proof. Okay, so we want to show that A is, uh, is close to B, where B is, B is our super cool matrix like this. So let's let's write a minus b the error a minus b as first we approximate it by the expected value that's matrix concentration and then we have this difference let's call this r let's call and this is actually p times identity yeah as Pablo suggested. Agreed? Expected value of A is this, B is this. If you take the difference, uh, will be minus, minus P times identity. It doesn't really matter. It's actually, so let's, let's take minus, uh, yeah, plus minus P times identity. Good. So the, the norm of that is, the norm of this is, uh, Operator norm is less than p, which is actually equals p. The operator norm of the di diagonal matrix is just the largest diagonal entry. So it's p and p is less than one. So that's that's gone. The main focus of our argument will be the will be r. So this is our r is a random matrix. Expected A minus expected value of A. Let's look up again. A is adjacency matrix whose entries are Bernoulli's and expected value of A is this. So here's an, an idea of how we handle this. A very beautiful idea actually. Decompose R entry by entry. And as a sum, as a sum of little matrices, each matrix will be totally zero except one entry. And because the entries are independent, 
will have a sum of independent random matrices. It's a trivial decomposition, just decompose it entry by entry. Yeah. We'll have to be a little bit careful because the matrix is symmetric. Not all entries are exactly independent. The IJ's entry is the same as JI's entry. So we have to keep these entries together, tied. So here is this decomposition. So let's decompose R entry by entry. It's a sum for all, uh, uh, we work up above the diagonal, let's say only RIJ, that's a value of the entry times the elementary matrix, where this elementary matrix looks like this. It's just zero, 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 zero. Let's say one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero. Uh, no. Zero, one, zero, 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 zero. So if this is I and this is J, this is I, and this is J, then this is an elementary matrix. I just want to separate them entry by entry, um, keeping the two entries, IJ and JI together. Is this decomposition clear? Is it clear what I mean? Yeah. So for each entry above the diagonal, I, I, have another, I have its own matrix, all zeros except one entry, and then tie the symmetric entries together. Perfect. In analytic form, this matrix can be described as EI, EI transpose plus EJ, EJ transpose, the elementary matrix, where, where EI is just the element, is just the, um, the vector with all zeros except one in the i-th entry. It's a canonical basis. So EI, EI transpose will be a matrix that's all zero except, so EI, sorry, EI, EJ, it should be EI, EJ plus EJ, EI, yes. So this matrix, EI, EJ transpose is a matrix that has all zeros except one entry, the IJ entry, which is one. Yeah, you gotta perform this computation. Yeah, one, zero, zero, zero. <laughs> times zero, one, zero, let's say zero, zero, one, zero. This will be zero, 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 one, zero, 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 zero. Okay. I think the second row is zero, zero, one, zero, no? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Good, so that's our, that's our decomposition, very good. The point of doing this, why we care to do that is that now we have here the sum, a sum of independent random matrices. And that is, and that is what we can handle now. We can, for example, apply matrix Bernstein's inequality. bound this random matrices are mean zero too. They're mean zero because we subtracted the expectation. So we can handle this by matrix Bernstein's inequality. And let me remind you what it was. It says that R, the, the operator norm of any sum of any independent random matrices mean zero is less than up to an absolute constant. The first approximation to the truth is sigma, where sigma is just sigma squared. It's just a matrix variance. Um, it's uh, expected value of the sum of matrices squared. Like this, that's our first approximation to the truth. Um, it's not exactly true. 
we have to add and this annoying it's, uh, well first of all it's there is log factor that comes in and second of all there is annoying extra term that nobody likes but it's a maximum uh, maximum norm of each matrix like this This is our matrix, um, matrix Bernstein's inequality that we did last time. It just says that the that this holds with high probability, with probability let's say greater than 0.99. Then we can make constant C large enough to accommodate that probability so that's matrix bernstein's inequality and it it's very simple it just tells us what exactly we have to compute now to finish the proof we have to compute this thing we have to compute this thing the second thing is super easy this one is no problem. what's rij it's they're bernoulli so it's zero or one so it's less than one zij's Bernoulli's well, ZIJ is uh, is one, so this is less than one. This, this this norm here is less than one, so I can safely take k equal ones. Gun. That's that's a minor thing. The major thing and, and most interesting is this. We need to square the matrices. Let's do that. Okay, this is fun. ZIJ squared. So we take this matrix and square it. Let's do it. And if you do it, I did it a couple of times at home here. A beautiful thing happens. These ones travel. They travel to the diagonal. So now they appear on the diagonal. Easy exercise to square that matrix. So in analytic form, it would be useful to write this as EI, EI transpose plus EJ, EJ transpose. Good, believable, you can do it in half line. Okay, good. You'll do the same actually in, in the current homework. Cool. Okay, so we're now we take their sum. So the sum i i j z i j squared. That's r i j squared, and the metric z i j squared is this e i e i transpose e j e j transpose. All right. Cool. There is kind of a cool symmetry here between i and j. Let's explore it. Let's separate this sum into two sums, EI, EI transpose, plus EJ, EJ transpose. I did nothing, just separated. But let's let's do this, this funny trick. Uh, this and this, they're so close. They look like they're almost there's this kind of a symmetry. So let's in the second sum, let's relabel i to j and j to i. Just call them oppositely. Let's see what happens. So let me do it in one step here for you. So now j is less than i. And here is r j i squared, which is which doesn't matter. Actually, this one is symmetric. All matrices are symmetric. And here is E I E I transpose. Okay, so I separated and I relabeled. Why? Why it's interesting? Because now we cover the entire sum. What is this? The first one covers I less than the pairs I less than J. The second one covers the opposite pairs I greater than J. There's nothing on the diagonal because it's zero. 
And so this means that the whole thing is just the entire sum i and j go from one to n, all of the pairs now, r i j squared, e i, e i transpose. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Just a symmetry trick. Not because diagonal is zero. Okay, cool. And this, uh, now there is no symmetry. Now actually J is not very present. So let's let's write this as a double sum, this sum, and then by J, R I J squared, E I, E I transpose. Okay, very good. So now we have a diagonal matrix. So this is actually a diagonal matrix. Because remember what EI, EI transpose are? Just all zeros except one entry on the diagonal, the I entry. And then we sum over all these entries. So they all only appear on the diagonal. So diagonal entries with, with these entries on the diagonal. And so it's norm, when we take its norm, of that matrix, that's gonna be the maximum, the maximum value on the diagonal. So it's maximum over one through N of, of this. Ah, I forgot to take expected value. So I'm taking expected value inside here too. And, and here, expected value R I J squared. Agreed? But, but is, isn't R I J has the same form as Z I J, meaning uh, exactly two numbers in the all zero mm -hmm. matrix? Yeah. So. The squared, it will also be the same kind of just two values on the diagonal. Yeah, exactly. That's maybe uh -huh. I will explain this. That's that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. R I J is the same as here. It will be just R I I here and R J J here, uh, and then we sum over all of them, and then we we'll get this. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a silly exercise. Just square this matrix, add them up. And, and and compute the max will be a diagonal diagonal matrix of course all of them like travel to the diagonal and then we just see how how much um but, so well this is very simple now what is it in the kind of the in the in the matrix form what is what is this this expression is about we have this matrix it's a block matrix boys and girls and let's just think of what, what this is we take maximum over i's and i is a row. So we take a row, let's say i throw, and then what do we do? And then we sum expected value of r i j squared. What are these? These are Bernoulli's only. Uh, so this is the variance of the Bernoulli's. Right? Remember what r is? r was a minus expected value of a. A was full of Bernoulli's. So therefore, expected value of RJs, this is a this is a variance of a Bernoulli random variable. Here we have Bernoulli's P, here we have Bernoulli's Q. And we sum over J's. So which means that we just sum, we take the I throw and we sum the elements of the row like this. There's n over two here, n over two here. So every row is the same. So it means that we're just summing, we're summing n over two variances of Bernoulli p and n over two variances of Bernoulli q. Agreed? That's because r is full of variances. Excellent. So this is n. Uh, what is this? This is 
this is, this is p times one minus p, right? The variance of Bernoulli, and this is q one minus q. So forget one minuses. Let's let's estimate simply. So this is less than n times p plus q uh, over two. Yeah, I think p plus q over two times n. I just just get rid of one minus p's, one minus q's. And p is, remember, p is scaled as a over n. And q is b over n. So in this scaling, it's a plus b over two times n. And without, without n, right? Oh, without n. Yeah, just a plus b over two. Yeah, thank you. Plus b over two, which is less than two, less than a. Because we assume that A is that the B, the, the, the opposite gender connection is less than A. That's it. Oh my goodness, this is so simple. So the variance has is just A. Good. So we just apply matrix Bernstein's inequality now. And R is bounded by again right there is bounded by sigma root log n plus this. This was very simple. This was just one. I can just forget about that. So R is less than sigma, which is A log n. And you know what, guys? Let me write this thing to hide absolute constants. So this means that there is an absolute constant up front in the front of this. Good, we bounded that one. So again, this was the first step and the major step. Now the, let, the rest will be easier. This was the first step in the proof where we bounded this thing and therefore we bound the whole A minus B. So A minus B. is less than uh, R plus, let me look up, R plus one. And I can hide one then. So A log N. So. Okay, so that was the first step. We bounded the error between A and this very nice block matrix for which we know everything. Second step is a perturbation theory, davies kahan uh, inequality. Says that if the two matrices are close, then the, the eigenvectors are close. Namely, the inequality is saying like this, it's less than the norm of the difference, the error, divided by the eigengap, by the spectral gap of B. Where the spectral gap is, is this. You look at the first eigenvalue. You look at the first eigenvalue right here. You look at the second eigenvalue, and you look at the third and fourth and so on and so forth. This, the others ones are zeros. The first eigenvalue was um, Yeah, someone is asking. Look at Marco is asking. Aren't you forget an element of order log n for estimation of norm R using matrix Bernstein's and well, yes, we are. Uh, actually, hold on. So this is what we have. A minus B is the norm of is less than the norm of R plus one. I'll forget one. One is just to, to one is smaller. And the norm of R is this. So what are we forgetting? Michael, I think it's everything is okay. I don't know.
maybe oh matrix business ah i forget, I forget. Yeah, you're right so k is less than one so we're forgetting this log k log n that's what you meant yeah i forget that one uh what do you do i don't want to go back to this yeah that should be k which is one times log n yes that that term i forgot you're right okay in the interest of time let me just say that this is still bounded by a log n this term will be smaller this term is smaller than this one and why by assumption of our theorem so this is an assumption of our theorem there is some log factor there and let me skip this step so I'll just say it's it's it will be in the lecture notes uh, if you if you can drive it but it's a little step saying that if you have something like this then log n is smaller than this and we can just get rid of it let me forget that so so it will be smaller because of a because of a exactly. right yeah yeah uh... yeah yeah because a is actually a this that assumption implies that a is larger than log n and therefore this is true good okay so davis kahan theorem very davis kahan theorem says that you you need to look at the eigengap which is uh, smaller of these two distances so you, you want to separate the eigenvalue from the rest lambda one the eigenvalue of b was let me let's look it up b was this very simple matrix eigenvalue was p plus q over two which in our scaling is just a plus b over two and this is a minus b over two okay now we go down so lambda one is a plus b over two this is a minus b over two the rest are zero so this distance is the difference is b here and the difference here is a minus b over two so the eigengap is the smaller of the two a minus two over minus b over two and b and this is where i assumed that where i just throw this extra assumption that a is less than 3b that makes the first term smaller so it's less than a minus b over two okay good so the difference between the eigenvectors let's call this u and v u minus v is then less than the norm here which is root of a log n divided by the eigengap which is a minus b and up to an absolute constant i hide it so this okay and this is a crucial moment where we say this has to be small this has to be let's say less than one tenth and to do that we need a minus b squared greater than uh, than a log n so that's why the assumption of the theorem I wanted this we wanted this eigenvectors be close and that's why we assumed that in the theorem maybe it doesn't look nat a natural assumption but that's the best one good agreed we show it again in the theorem we assume this why we assume this to make this step finally to show that the eigenvectors are close and if eigenvectors are close in the Euclidean norm that if we square things the Euclidean norm is this um, it's less than one over 100 I just squared both sides explain what the Euclidean norm is now the, the last step I just want to make the signs the same 
and I, I want to make the coefficients very similar. So if the sum of the numbers is less than 100, that means that at most 1% of these numbers, at most 1% of these numbers can be larger than 1 over n. You just think logically. If the sum of the numbers is less than 100, then at most 1% of these numbers can be larger than 1 over n. Because if, if, if there's one more than 1% larger than 1 over n, that 1% will contribute 1 divided by n times n divided by 100, which is, which is 100. And that means that 99% of these numbers are less than are less than one over n. So if most one percent is bad, at least 99% is good. Now let's multiply by n, take the square root. V i, this is now the fun part. It's less, strictly less than one over n. Less than one over n. And that is it. Remember what this vi is. Vi was the eigenvector of b, which was this one actually is ones on the boys and zero and minus ones on the girls. One, one, minus one, minus one. So all one coefficients. And these coefficients are, are close, are closer than one. Therefore, they must agree. Therefore, the signs of UIs must agree with the sign with these signs of VIs, which determine which determine the, the, the community membership. So the summary is that we proved that with high probability, with probability at least 0.99. That was in the application of Bernstein's inequality, like this, with this probability. At least 99% of the coefficients of the 99% of the coefficients of the eigenvector of the adjacency matrix agree with the coefficients of B, the block matrix that gives the community structure. And thus, they correctly determine the membership. Yeah. How how is this looking? A little bit technical, right? I I hope that was be less technical. Sorry, and we went over time a little bit. the The principle is very simple. <laughs> it's approximate a by its expectation. Look at expectation and see. Oh, it has a block structure. Therefore, the eigenvectors determine the community structure, and a is close. So Davis Cahan tells you that. The eigenvectors of a must, must, must be that, and they must determine the community structure. So that's that's the whole idea. It's just how you implement it a little bit technically. Yeah, it's, it's also uh, like this 99%, usually the setup is like, we have some constant that we control. And mm -hmm. if we push it far enough, we get 99%. Here we have 99%, but it's not immediately obvious what we control. I I, I, I still don't understand. Ah, like uh, there is yeah, this yeah, yeah. inequality for A and B. So probably it pushes it somehow in the correct direction. Yeah, 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 I will yeah. have to think about it later. No, no, that's okay. Let, let's actually, since we're finishing anyway, let's rewrite this more, more nicely. If you want probability, let's say less, greater than one minus, let's say Delta, and you would like the accuracy is like uh, one minus epsilon percentage. So that means that this constant is not really a constant, but it's it's some function of delta and epsilon times a log n. 
And that is what the proof actually gives you, right? Nothing is special to, to, to the number 0.99 is a proof. You just set it one minus epsilon and track the dependence on epsilon in the proof. So that's that's what the actual proof is giving us. Um, I guess maybe it would be something like one like something like one divided by delta epsilon, maybe something like that. So the smaller the delta and epsilon, the, so the better accuracy you want, the bigger the constant you have to take. The, like the more separation you have to allow. Something like that. Any questions? Any other questions? Hey guys, you raised your hand. Yes, Alexander, go ahead. Alexander, did you no, want to ask? No, 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 sorry. I, I <laughs> better ask after. <laughs> no problem. Um, was it a difficult proof, guys? No? Oh, good. It should be. It should feel difficult. It may be feel difficult because how you square things is a lot of technicalities. But really, the, in the homework, there is a sim similar problem, and and you would do it in a similar way. Just concentration plus Davis Kahn. Excellent. So what happens next? Let me just briefly explain what what will happen next. Based on this proof, this idea, we will. Get inspired next time and it will be lighter next time we'll just realize how to let's say handle more than two communities because now the signs of course are you can't rely on the signs plus or minus one with more than two communities anymore obviously so we'll 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 get inspired and get more than two communities uh, that will inspire further development of spectral algorithms for community detection and for general exploration of networks uh, under the general umbrella of spectral algorithms uh, spectral clustering and then um then i will we will take a little bit break maybe to, to, tomorrow uh, the, on on wednesday and discuss general visualization techniques for high dimensional data how to visualize networks based on spectral things like we discussed now uh, and general point sets general data in high dimensions also inspired by this uh, so we'll work with isomap which uh, which is a, a, tec a spectral technique for data visualization very nice one and and then we'll go into the more modern world uh last four or five years maybe more a little bit where people start to depart from spectral non-spectral techniques such as tsni umap and others um and yeah so we'll work with that maybe on wednesday and then on friday we'll start something else good we made a very good first step toward that any questions okay guys perfect we're meeting today who are we meeting today i already forgot oh but uh but look how's your starlink <laughs> okay <laughs> Let, let's try yeah Let's try. Yeah, okay, let's try today. <laughs> All right, and everybody else, it was very nice to see you again after the weekend, and we will see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for that. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Leave meeting. No. Okay, left meeting. Can I ask uh, one small question? Maybe of not course. for the record, uh, but I have oh, a yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry, stop recording.